Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Maxon booth here at Day 2 NAB 2024 here in Las Wages, Nevada. I'm accompanied by some of the most amazing artists here on the planet, some of which have been designing the future for decades. To my left is none other than the one, the only Robin Haddow. You've seen her work in major feature films, both, I think, Marvel, DC, even all over. Yes, yeah, Multiverse. Mu through the many multiverses. And uh, she's here to share with you some of her amazing techniques for UI design. Take it from here. Give her a big round of applause, everyone. Hey guys, thanks for being here with me today. My name is Robin Haddo. I am a freelance motion graphic artist and designer. Uh, please check out my website, uh, just my name, at robinhaddo.com uh, to see more examples of my work. I specialize in creating FUI, that's fantasy or future user interface graphics for film, TV, experiences, and video games. Uh, and what that is, is designing screen graphics for actors on set or in post-production in order to contribute to the overall mood and tone of an imagined world. And in, I have an example here um, from uh, the pilot of The Flash, and in this case, uh, we're looking at the layer of the cortex, which was home to the Flash's uh, group of ragtag scientists, where they would help the Flash remotely uh, try to outsmart uh, metahumans from the safety of their uh, remote base. So another example of screen graphics here uh, would be the blog for Iris West at Central City News. And um, I designed this graphic, uh, the title, my good friend and longtime colleague, Jer Unrau, did the design and layout of the blog. And I focused on the title design for Saved by the Flash. And what I really love about this graphic is that it visually conveys and says so much. Uh, if that doesn't say fast or you can't catch me, I don't know what does. And that was made in C4D's uh, MoText object, a uh, series of gradient shaders and bevels and chamfers for the edges, and uh, a whole bunch of displacer deformers on splines for the lightning. So that covers the, or that was seen um, all in the Central City newsroom um, in a couple seasons of The Flash. Uh, most commonly, everybody is familiar with the access granted screen that um, is the most famous or well-known and used screen graphic, uh, which essentially the essence of screen graphics is uh, to help tell a story and visually assist the actor in advancing the plot of the script or the movie forward. Um, and it's just become a, a funny joke nowadays because I guess ha everywhere, you know, you sort of need to get an access granted with your technology to go into a website, get into your house, access granted to go into your car. It's sort of become commonly a uh, well-used, well, well well-known term. Uh, I love holograms. I think they're so uh, fun and beautiful the way that light naturally interacts with graphics and the sort of natural lensing and artifacting that they convey. Um, it's so inherently cool, I think, to see actors interact with them spatially and in the environment. Uh, I worked with Cantina uh, Creative in collaboration. I was remote uh, with creative director Stephen Laws. Uh, he's a longtime mentor and fantastic creative mind that I always love working with on this. Uh, it was a triple layered light table in WandaVision and the team, myself and the team there, Carly Serquan and Julianne Dome, I think Matt Eaton was involved in um, putting together and assembling the whole sequence where uh, the real challenge was this, was how was all of the information going to be um, emitted from the brain of the sort of the epicenter of the OS in the uh, center of the light table uh, to go up through three layers and then you have a floating hologram that uh, 
sword command was um, using to identify all of the strange anomalies that were happening in the town of Westview when Wanda, I don't want to do any spoilers for the show, but uh, Wanda Scarlet Witch and her magic was maybe involved in uh, commandeering how everybody was going to act in uh, society. There, again, another collaboration I did with Cantina, uh, Stephen Laws and Carly again on this one. It was so much fun was to develop the heads up display uh, for the Taskmaster, which was the first time we saw Taskmaster on the big screen in Black Widow. And the challenge, uh, or I think the fun or unique um, skill of Taskmaster was that their superpower was uh, mimic mode, where they could learn um, and study the skill and moves of their opponent uh, in, in, in so far as they would outsmart them or learn the moves better than the oppon opponent in order to beat them at their own game. So, um, yeah, without further ado, let's uh, check out some more graphics. Now that everybody knows what screen graphics are, uh, we can see some more of my work. Okie doke, uh, thank you guys for viewing all of that with me. I've been doing this for a number of years, so I suppose there's quite a bit of content uh, over time. Um, but without further ado, I want to get into showing you some of the techniques that I use in Cinema 4D in order to create some of these graphics. And then along the way, I would like to dovetail in 
uh, some of my thinking and thought processes about how I intertwine story into it because I just want to say it's not like there's crazy, um, you know, high level techniques that I'm doing inside of cinema. It's just the way that I believe it to be very important to detail and bringing in story for characters, particularly when you're dealing with imagined worlds or comic book uh, superheroes uh, in order to bring uh, imagined worlds alive. So it, they're not complicated techniques, it's just sort of the uh, sewing or weaving together of all of the elements. Um, so what I want to share uh, with everybody here today is um, resurrecting Atlantis. And if you've all seen Aquaman 1 recently, uh, maybe a, a couple months ago or in the summer, uh, Aquaman 2, The Lost Kingdom, came out and I was um, asked to uh, contribute to some of the already established environments uh, inside uh, Atlantis, which is the underwater world where uh, Aquaman um, um, sort of resides in all this like high tech or very clean, slick looking um, technology exists. And again, I did this in collaboration with uh, Cantina Creative in Los Angeles and Vancouver. And what this was, the assignment here particularly, oh, let's, li let's look at a still uh, from the movie here, was um, the dashboard uh, holographic display that where all of these navigational widgets from one of the Atlantean transport vessels were, were emitting um, from this like underwater sea creature and uh, communicating with other um, friendlies being uh, uh, underwater fishies in the sea, like uh, uh, whales and uh, squid, octopus, sea creatures to um, defend against the uh, avenge, uh, avenging Black Manta, who is trying to avenge his father's death. So uh, I did this uh, with my team uh, at Cantina. Darby Facinto helped me um, here with some of the graphic design, Stephen Busey, uh, Nate Jess, and a number of other people. Uh, so let's talk about this uh, sound displacer, I guess um, the waveform com comms device about how uh, Aquaman was communicating with the whales. Uh, um, and uh, here's a, a rough slap comp, just so we can get an idea of motion. And then again on black to focus on the holograms, because those are our favorite things. And here I want to show you how I made this waveform um, uh, communication device inside Cinema 4D. And so we can take a ref reference back to that if need be. Um, but what I did in order to make the uh, sound wave comms device was use a helix spline and uh, reduce the uh, radius so that I just had a f uh, straight spline. And then I put the helix inside a MoGraph cloner object as a uh, child of the cloner and uh, reduce, or I turn the uh, mode into a linear mode and reduce the height to 50. And maybe let's say, let's make it in about uh, five, uh, space, give it a little bit of space between each of the splines and up our count to something like seven. It's not an exact number here, but just to get some more depth to our waveform. And uh, my go-to uh, lately, it seems this year, is I'm all about the displacer deformer. And um, with the displacer deformer, um, that's, well, hold on, I'm getting ahead of myself. I want to tell you that I like to put all of my uh, uh, widget here, sound. I like to put everything under a null object in order to uh, layer things as systems. And I will show you why a little bit later, because then we can riff off of the base uh, spline in order to make variations or other uh, anomalies um, used out of the same system. But I will show you what I mean by all that in just one minute here. Uh, in the displacer, what I love about that is because I'm also constantly uh, aware and trying to make things loop because that way when I send things off to production, if it spans a number of shots and um, 96, we'll give this a four frame uh, 
we'll give this a nice uh, four second note start. C4D starts on zero, so let's make that 95 frames so that we have a solid four second loop. And uh, that way the animation goes forever and if um, production needs more or other houses need more, they can just uh, loop our elements. And I go into the shader tab and use Cinema 4D's procedural noise system. And I love that too because you have access to a whole bunch of um, different noise uh, models. And we'll, I'll just use the default um, noise because that gives me the pattern that you can see already that is, oh, I'm in the wrong axes here. So what I'll do is I'll go into the displacer object and um, uh, make this into a uh, tangent so it's affecting um, on the Y axis. Uh, let's go planar, what am I doing here? Vertex normal planar and we will affect it on the Y um, and we'll keep that intensity up and I can change the height here so that you can see that the waveform is more dramatic and when I press play, nothing's going because I need to tell my uh, noise in the shader tab that I would like some animation. And the animation speed here, because this is ambient, there's no like message from the whales or there's no, no um, dialogue coming through. It's just ambient um, background animation. We'll keep it something like slow, let's say 0 0.4. And as I mentioned to you, let's um, acknowledge our loop. And because the noise system uh, references things in seconds and our timeline is in frames. We'll, we know 90, 96 frames is a four second loop, so we'll put four seconds into our count. And now you see when we play our, uh, play through the timeline, we've got our animation. Uh, another important thing with um, holograms or screen graphics or these sort of designs with world building is to pay homage to the set design and vehicles or, or, or suits or other uh, geometry and shape language that exists in the world. In this case, this is an obvious example in that I want to follow the um, contour of the vessel. So I used a bend deformer uh, to, in order just to uh, bend our sound wave and I'll make that a child of in our system. And in order to just see how that's interacting with the splines, we can turn up the strength. And right away, you can see the angle uh, that's dropped into my bend deformer. And I can just adjust that. Uh, I'm going to uh, embarrass myself here with the math. Uh, hold on a sec. I can just adjust that so that the angle curves. Oh god, I practiced this so many times and now, so okay, see, you can see the twist and I didn't snap it to hard 90s, but that doesn't matter because I'm just showing this for demonstration and not the actual contour of the vessel, but that is how I did it. And the main reason why I wanted to show you the bend deformer in use is because with it active, you can see that we are getting another layer of complexity that is super beautiful. Um, between all of my um, splines here and that like without it, they are all quite uniform. And uh, with it, we get that Z depth uh, layer of, or level of complexity that is um, added to, uh, um, I have the scene open here, added to make it look visually more complex. Uh, and there are a couple of different ways you can render this out because we are using uh, splines. There's no actual geometry here at the moment. And so I'll just make a new um, file here super quick so we can start this from the ground up. And what I have done here, oh, that's my, my secret, my, my secret number two. Uh, what we, I'll show you that in a sec. What we have done here is I've used the hair renderer, which is, um, in the standard, in Cinema 4D's standard renderer. I'll open up our render settings. You see that the render is in standard. We will draw, add our hair render to the scene because in order to make that, um, in order to make your render settings acknowledge that we want to access the hair render, we open up a hair material, which I copy and pasted already in here. And what I love about the hair system is that 
um, again, you get another access to another set of parameters that you can customize, like the, co the color, the gradient, the line thickness here. We can get into specular and different frizz, kink, density, clump, all of these other um, parameters that we can adjust to customize and make our uh, things unique. And so now you can see, and also you can adjust the mapping um, on the, with the gradient tab, you can uh, adjust the color ramps. And I just want to point out that you need to um, have your um, hair render tag uh, on your spline in order for the hair renderer to see it. So that is just another point um, to acknowledge. And when I was making this, I thought, hey, this is super cool. Uh, in order to have some ambient background noise. But like I mentioned, what if there was some important dialogue that was coming through, like Dr. Shin was communicating, um, he's like on the other side and he wanted to give them a secret message that you know, Black Manta was coming or he was close, hot on the tail. And so um, also today with a lot of um, visualization, visualizations and future tech, people have custom dialogue that they want to see visualized. And um, I thought, hey, I wonder if instead of using the displacer object, why don't we use the sound effector? And um, with that, I dropped the MoGraph sound effector into our scene and loaded up a uh, background like percussion track, which um, you can see the um, waveform visualized in this uh, sort of amplitude graph here below. And well, let's just turn off the bend deformer so you can see here. Nothing's happening. And that is because our, we want our, you can see the waveform is activated, but nothing's happening in terms of motion on our splines. And um, that is because we want to tell our sound effector that we would like the deformation to happen on uh, point mode. And so there you can see that the animation from the waveform is affecting our splines. And then in order to break down uh, the, the deformation to happen on individual points, we can turn our sampling to step. And I wish I had more time, just with anything, to play with visualizing what the sort of sound effector, the possibilities that the sound effector opens up, because just with this um, mapping, drawing out the mapping, you can see how visually I am uh, tuning the look of my waveform by moving the sample selection alongside the graph. And if I extended my timeline out even, you can sample more, like my percussion tracks, maybe one minute or something, you know, and you can play with, easily adjust or tweak the look of your waveform and mapping it along the spline so it starts in various places. Um, which I think is super cool. And then also in order to like fine tune the um, type of spline or curve that you want to use, you can um, play with the, in the like intermediate points in that if you want it to have more curve, you can have a B spline or um, adaptive subdivided. So it opens up a lot of different channels for you to customize the look of your waveform. And so earlier I mentioned that I like to nest everything uh, under a null to create a system, because now that we have all this uh, layer, this layering set up, we can use the work, uh, like the, the work of the stack or the uh, flow of the pipe that we just built with a, a different spline. And I was doing that with a, I just dropped a circle spline, um, for example, into this in the same system. Oops, let me load my sound file up here again and see what's happening here. Um, looks like it's a bit heavy because maybe I've sweep, I sweep geometry instead of using the hair renderer on this one. I also cloned spheres onto um, my circle spline in order to get some visual interest and something that looks a little bit different as well. 
It's funny that the play, playback, it's odd that it's lagging a little bit here. Um, perhaps it's because my splines, um, we can pay attention to my circle splines, are subdivided five and I have many of them, 17. What if I just re reduce that down to eight for the sake of playback here, speeding it up. And I'll give you, I'll hit Command R to get a quick render, pre whoop, render preview. And why isn't that working? It's because I turned off my sweep and we'll turn that back on. And so you can see um, that we've got the same track, but a completely different look to our visualizer um, in that it's um, using a circle spline in, in the round. Uh, so that's cool. It opens up a lot of possibilities. All right, moving on. I wanted to talk about um, the uh, radar that I have happening inside of the uh, ship. I'll just streamline some of this a little bit here. Um, and that is this, I'll hit render here so we can see, that is this proximity um, sort of te telemetry scanner of the environment to suggest like, oh, are there any um, incoming baddies as well? Again, let's be on alert. O obviously here we have um, the Jebelian team, they're like the warmongers, and we've got some alerts with being red circling around our coral. And what I want to bring up is to tie in story again here. Like, sure, we could have just had a cube or we could have had a sphere. Like, I have these planet looking um, terrain mapping um, navigation gimbals, which have their own special role. But I want to, I'll go back to that in a second. Um, the coral here um, pays homage to the fact that um, the technology and the whole world of uh, Atlantis is build, built up of coral. And I was reading the art of and the world building that went into the first production and um, the natural fragmentation process that happens when uh, sort of it's like a starfish. If you lose a limb, another one grows. And that's exactly how um, the technology uh, came to be in the world of Atlantis. And I really, really loved that whole um, organic nature paired with something that's like high tech and technology, with technology which is very robotic and mechanical. There's something um, really beautiful to me when you can, um, you know, synergetically have this paradox with two um, things that aren't, aren't like the other, and it just like feels really nice to me. I like uh, organic mechanical things a lot. So we'll reference this back again if, uh, if need be, so I um, don't waste too much time. Um, but I want to show you how I made that coral because it was getting into um, Mogra Cinema 40's MoGraph and Fields. And that is, again, using the procedural noise that comes inside of Cinema. But not only is this like the flat texture mapping that I showed you, like the, using the flat texture maps that was in um, the first setup, this is using volumetric noise. And we'll just hit an B here so we get uh, visualization of our uh, faces because we want to have something to deform. And again, I went into my displacer, my favorite, the displacer and the shader deformer because you have access to the procedural noise, uh, therefore you can loop and when in doubt, loop it. So then you're, everybody's always happy. You just have a ton of um, animation to have or not have. So we'll go into the shader tab. And again, I'll just use um, the default noise that we used in the same spline setup. So it's the same technique, but only this time, instead of uh, placing it on splines, I'm using geometry. Um, and well, here we go. <laughs> so let's open up, let's get some animation. Let's make sure that our frame count is in 24. And you can set this up by default um, by making a new .c4d file and dropping that into your frame rate 24, dropping that into your frame rate, whoa, 24, dropping that into your um, preferences folder so that it will open up and start that way every single time. Um, we'll give ourselves 119, so we have a five-second loop here. And um, 
Next up, what I want to do, oops, we'll stop that. It's probably not helping the performance issues of our uh, thing here. Next up, what I want to show you is that I used the um, volume uh, builder and the volume measure in order to um, generate the natural looking geometry. So I will call upon those tools into our scene and I will make the cube a child of our volume uh, builder where um, I guess it's sort of like the matrices object, like the cloner, there's no, if I hit a render here, there's no actual geometry or you can't see anything here. So I'll drop our voxel size down to something like two so we have a bit of a tighter mesh to work with. Um, hit play. And oh, we, again, we've got to tell our um, shader and the displacer deformer that we want to have some animation. Let's do something like 0 0.7, and we have five seconds here, so we'll make a loop of five. Not that we really need it, but I will also up the contrast a little bit so that we can see uh, a little bit more deformation. We'll hit play, and I've got a whole bunch of tessellation happening because of the displacer, and um, I kept my segments down to a somewhat reasonable amount so I'm not overwhelming the machine. Once I drop it into the volume measure, you can see right away how much it sub -Ds my geo uh, to smooth out the uh, surface, but what I also can then do is add a smooth. SDF smooth inside the volume builder in order to smooth out, we'll hit NA so you can see the um, geometry, the difference a bit, there you go. So you can see uh, with, with and without the smooth how that affects our geometry. And I'll go ahead and push play. So we have some animation going in there. Let's make it a little bit bigger just for demonstration's sake. We can see, well, you know what, I'll put it like, whoa, crazy, 1.5 and um, so you can see we've got a bit like an organic blob. We no longer have a, um, oops, a, a primitive cube. And then I went into using a twist modifier or deformer twist, um, which will again create a null to drop everything into a system because we're going to want to reuse that uh, and in order to stack elements. And here you can see that I'm starting to manipulate the geometry in a way that um, we're starting to um, get some more organic looking shapes. Um, and we'll throw another bend into our scene. You can see that what, like I'm, I'm, I'm playing, right? Like it's just like I'm kind of molding the geometry as if it were clay. I'm not doing anything fit to parent. I'm not doing anything so technical or you know, I'm not getting lost in the weeds. I'm totally just um, like as if I were molding Play-Doh or, you know, sitting down at a table and um, having fun. So I'll turn off my visualizers of the bend and the twist, which you can use these traffic lights here, or you can filter them out of the panel here just so we can concentrate on looking at the geometry. And you can see that this organic shape is something original and, um, whoop. Um, new, but how do we get some of that porous looking, um, how do we get some of that porous looking stuff? So let's call this, name this one inner one, for example, the cube, and then I will duplicate my um, cube uh, with the displacer object and call one of these inner and one of these outer so, to, uh, so we know which one's which, and we'll go back into our volume builder and it automatically dropped in my inner and my outer, we'll make sure that the relationship um, inner and outer, okay, so we want the outer one on top because we are going to subtract the uh, inner one from the outer one. And what I can do is see my inner is change the geometry such that we can see how its effectors are are working or influencing, we have to make it look a little bit different because it's doing a 3D like Boolean, uh, doing a Boolean um, operation. And here it was just playing like so like, and like, like this is super cool looking, right? To get this like organic looking natural um, shape 
uh, and so I can play with my noise. And if we wanted it to, we can actually have it animated. So this could even become like, um, no longer is it just like a, uh, a not, a, 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 or it's more like an amorphous object. Imagine that it was being projected from a crystal display and you get to see all the technology of the liquid crystals molding and conforming and actually live um, like wondering what the magic or the technology is. So it adds, uh, it opens up a channel um, to bring a little bit more life into your scene if you want. And again, there's like no science. You can manipulate the, um, the shape of the inner and outer. I could, there that looks more like, a, that's more, um, there's more form to that. So that looks more like it could be a coral, uh, coral reef, you know, in Hawaii, the fishies can go swimming through that. And um, let's hit play. Yeah, like it's so, super beautiful. Like every, every single time I've done, I've recreated the scene, it's um, different. So I'm going to, because I have a lot of things that I want to share with you, um, I'm going to open up uh, one that I've already made here and steal, um, I'm going to steal the uh, foe or the enemies that I have circulating around here, the enemy ships. And I made those the same way. Um, what I did was I just um, edit copy, uh, hit V to go to our new file. What I hit paste, so we have our um, enemy ship number one in our scene. And I just made this organic looking um, you know, piece of geometry in the exact same way. And so in order to get this circling around and doing a perimeter scan of our coral, I have, I added a circle spline and I didn't want to keep it totally uh, uniform to a circle. I wanted it to have a little bit of um, just a different width or use an ellipse. I just wanted it to be more interesting. And onto my um, ship, I added an align to spline tag. Oops, I, there's a hotkey there, which is a tag here in animation, align to spline. And once I have that dropped onto my object, I can drop that into my spline path. And you can see that the um, geometry snaps to the path. And because I had some animation on the tag from the previous file, you can see that it is rotating and following along the spline. I'll go to the end of my timeline here and just crank it up. What do I have here? 65%, 56 to 65. Let's just make it a little bit bigger so you can see the, how, how it's traveling. And in order to get that ambient sort of activity, um, just l sort of life, like I like having a little bit of tumble, tumbler, tumble or secondary animation. I used a wiggle, I think that's what, or vibrate expression. After Effects, I'll, I'll put a wiggle expression on something just to add a little bit of life or movement. And again, that's in uh, the animation tags, uh, vibrate. And what I also love about this too, like After Effects wiggles too, is you can have a seed. So um, I can now copy my same circle ship relationship system, duplicate that, and um, rotate it around. And I then have different, like, you know, a number of different ships. We have six vessels. I could even clone it and uh, change the, I could, you know, I could even to take advantage of Momograph. Momograph all the time. I could use a cloner uh, to have it travel around um, our curl. But for this here, let's just, um, Keep it moving. Keep it moving, people. And um, I can let's do a quick render preview. Yeah, like I want, you know, you kind of want to adjust the scale. Like each one of these, they don't have to be the same. Um, we can move the circle spline up, and we'll do a playthrough here. And it's just a subtle. Um, there was no message, like the threat was already there incoming. But the other thing I want to point out is, and you can ch set this up in your new to customize your file if you want to have some animation uh, keyframe preferences. Is like here, we'll, we want to make sure, oops, we'll start that at zero. We want to make sure that our keyframes are set to linear. So and the default is spline natively. You can set that in your preferences just so that when, in fact, we do have a loop, there's no ease in or ease out, and it will just be a continuous animation. Um, oh, yeah, see, I love that motion that's happening on the coral. It's like we're, we're living it. We're, we're in Atlantis. 
So I'm going to take a new, I've got, you know, I made for the ships, I made a, a soft a material just using a Fresnel object uh, in the um, transparency, transparency tab. That's my go-to just because Fresnel, what the Fresnel does, here, let's make a new default. Let's make sure that we are in uh, the standard render and the new default material. If I go to our transparency channel and um, the glass 1.5 level of refraction is for a glass, drop it down to one that is fully transparent. And what's so neat about um, the Fresnel is that it gives you your hot spots or it gives you that hot edge on whatever is um, facing the um, invert gradient, that's a right click, whatever is facing the um, camera. So you can add a color here. Let's keep it kind of in our underwater blue language. Um, the reflectance feels a little bit hot, so we'll put that there. Drop this onto our um, volume measure, command R for a render preview, and you can see that we are getting some nice um, depth. I could add some ambient occlusion, but again, we're, we're um, going for speed, and we can add all of that stuff in post after. And I don't think this needs it, but what I want to show you um, how I did was for the emitter in the, because everything was came from this uh, hollow bed, this sort of um, like dashboard projection base. Let's look back at our image so I can, um, just so you can see really quick. Oh, I got 40 minutes, I got to keep going, wow. It was just like this tech base. Um, uh, and I'm panicking because I want to show you more things. So let's, uh, anyways, it was like a holographic bed um, that where the emitters were projecting the um, hologram. So in order to do that is I used a spotlight and if we rotate, uh, let me just orient myself here a little bit and not embarrass myself like I did with the bend former, orient this 90 degrees, drop that down, you can see um, how the spotlight is affecting the geometry interactively here in the viewport. And what I want to do is go into the spotlight uh, tab here and change our visible light to be volumetric. So if I, I'll just give you a render preview so you can see that here we are just seeing the uh, effect of the lighting, the spotlight. I'll turn that up quite a bit so you can see and I'll render preview that so you can see the spec hit there, that's from the spotlight. Once I go into the visible light tab and change it to volumetric, you can see the light source. And all of a sudden we're having the, a little subtle bit of interactivity here. You can see where the light source is uh, interacting with the geometry, um, which I think is super cool. And I want to color that a little bit of our nice blue here to set, um, to keep in style with the scene. And what I also really like about the spotlight is that if you go into the visibility tab and um, check enable the colored edge fall off, as well as the gradient, we can customize the color of like the core. So we're in a cool environment. Um, let's like make a cool tone um, sort of lighting here, lighting gradient here. And now when I hit um, render, you can see that the core of our light source of the emitter can have another, an added level of heat, which is cool because you want to sort of bring in real world lighting effects and lensing in order to make all those like little subtleties stacked upon each other um, help to contribute to um, the world uh, building. Okay, so really quick, I'm going to add a what did I use, a torus, I think, because I can control the pipe segments and I want to make a slick looking, futuristic um, kind of emitter, something that looks, um, you know, custom and like nobody has, uh, nobody has it here. Um, and let's add a tube to give it a, yeah, tube, let's add a tube to give it a little bit more um, weight here or presence in the scene. And this is effectively, let's hit NA so we can see, or let's add a scene, that's why, or add a light. That's why uh, my geometry looks so dark. I thought it was because of all the faces, but um, there it's not. Let's add a, just a, um, I beg your pardon, let's just add a um, omni light to our scene. We'll drag that up top. Let's um, make that a contrasting color, maybe like a light purple. 
uh, crank up the intensity a little bit here too. So you can see, or even we could make it, um, I don't know, a little bit bluer, like different, like the underwater thing. Like here, it just opens up another possibility to get more um, color and interaction onto our object, which I think is kind of cool. And now you can see, we can see our base, which is what was hiding on us before. Uh, I'll throw um, this Fresnel material that I made onto the base as well. And um, one thing that I think is missing is that we want to have those sort of light deformations or contrast. See, this light feels that it is just one constant, like boom, flashlight. That is not, um, we, can, we can make that better. That is not really accurate, particularly for being underwater. I think it's just more visually interesting to um, have more contrast in it. And so what I'm going to do is essentially create a gobo. And we'll use a default material um, in the luminance channel. We'll take off the reflectance here. And I just added a disk into our scene. We'll open up the noise. Um, Cinema 4D's noise, and let's go, we'll change the random seed just because we'll add some cranial noise because it has that more organic, billowy looking um, algorithm. And we'll, did I swap that? I just want to make sure that I swapped the, yeah, we'll change the color picker so that we're mapping uh, the grayscale value to be, uh, let's put that on our disk. We just want to map it so that we are looking through um, our geometry, and we can animate this as well, 0 0.5, and what was I, a five second loop? So we'll go like this, and then, I, <coughs> excuse me, I'm gonna copy and paste this shader, going in our texture, copy shader, go into our alpha, paste the shader, and I'm gonna turn it on to image alpha. So effectively, we've made this gobo where the light rays will shine through, um, will shine through our mat. I don't actually think I really need, necessarily need that in our, um, the luminance channel turned on. So what I'm gonna do is get a compositing tag so we don't, we hide the, um, let's go into tag, get a compositing tag, uh, render tags, compositing, so we hide the geometry from the camera because seen, seen by camera, if I uncheck that, then we can see how the um, noise, let's make it a bit smaller and crank up even, let's make our global scale, the texture smaller and maybe um, in the luminance channel, like we can just sort of play with how the light, you can see how it's affecting it here. And we can also stack, like make a layer shader and stack this noise here, let's, Go into cranial, because I see, there we go, that's what I was looking for. You want to see this sort of spindly, um, thready, um, cotton candy-esque sort of thing, so you can see how we're getting all of that difference and interaction from the texture into our light element. And then I can also adjust in the light tab, in my spotlight tab, that's my, I need to start labeling things, but here's my like emitter spot, and that's my source from above. Uh, but anyways, like this is more, uh, we can get into um, setting up scene files properly another time, maybe tomorrow, same place, same time, I'll be here at 1.30. Uh, oop, uh, oop, set my preferences, command R. You can see how the light's doing that. I can also adjust the range in, um, the, uh, in my volumetric, that, like how, uh, how do I say this? I can adjust the like start and end points of my light. So if we didn't want to have it casting so much onto the geometry, or I can open up the cone uh, a little bit more and I can define the um, level of fade, I guess. Yeah, the minimum fade or maximum fade opacity of how the light interacts with um, our object. So we can talk about wireframes another time too, because I was going to show you that, a really neat technique, but I want to get into looking at a few more um, details of our uh, set design work here. Um, and that was, for example, we were also tasked with designing the um, uh, technician stations for a series of um, soldiers on the baddie side, like the team of Black Manta, who are trying to 
um, go after and um, avenge uh, Aquaman. And I did not, I grabbed this image here um, from IMDB that was from the trailer of the movie, just so you can see an exterior shot of the vessel and the ominous sort of looming presence that um, the team, like the Black Manta group of soldiers operated. And here you can see one of the operator stations, there were maybe about 12 different pilots that were um, technicians that were piloting this ship. And um, one of the um, like neat things or special features of the uh, Manta ship was that it would operate into stealth mode. And stealth mode, it would go into this sort of a cloaking like you do in um, space or, um, movies is cloaking in visibility mode where all of the onset practical light sources went red and therefore um, the screen graphics or the displays in the piloting stations needed to like tell, tell the um, pilots where they were for terrain mapping and where um, um, like geography, where how to drive and um, navigate the ship, and also like if there were were any of the good guys, which were the bad guys to them, incoming. And um, so, what I wanted to share with you is sort of a bit of the process um, in, in so far as how to break down a task when you're tasked with um, set dressing in this way. And the first thing I like to do is go into Illustrator, and I'll get the um, cutout. You can see here. We can have like a die cut. I took the di a die cut of the bridge of one of these consoles, and like again, there was like um, 12 of them. Okay, so that were um, all repeated out through the um, bridge of this ship, and I'll get a die cut of the shape, um, draw that out into Illustrator, and make a framework, like a, ba a UI base for the consoles in which um, is providing the feedback to the actors. And in this case. Um, what it was was this retro, um, because Necris tech, you know, happens in time travel, and when the plates collide and they come up from the surface, uh, surface underneath and the, uh, the tectonic plates, only at a specific point in the DC universe. And here we were welcomed with the evil uh, Necris uh, people and their retro technology. Um, and so this was very much like tactile looking. Um, levels and meters and dials, um, but in order to have some interesting looking uh, yet real world elements, I created this framework in which I knew that I was going to put some fun uh, animation in there. And uh, when in doubt, let's go MoGraph all the time because you can get animation quickly and um, you can loop it, like I said, and default, um, we have the landscape object, which terrain, if you're doing some navigation, that is sort of a, um, a go-to. Like every, every, you know, you're going to need to customize the map in which you can use relief maps and get real world GIS data and drop that in, um, Dam Earth. In this case, we were underwater in a fictitious world, so I knew that I could um, just use a custom lands landscape or just use a landscape object and um, drop it into the scene and build out animation um, that way. So first idea, you know, when I'm getting started is that I like to say, okay, I thought, well, is it going to work on a plane? Like I'll, I'll um, test out proof of concept in MoGraph um, and I knew that I wanted to have some animation like again with a far like vanish or a near and front fall off and um, I could see um, that doing this uh, MoGraph plane effector was going to work in that way but you can see here that it's um, like gobbling up um, the plane in its um, how do you say entirety and I wanted to have a little bit more um, I wanted to have a little bit more unique or a better looking uh, deformation in so far as I wanted to affect the uh, polygons. And here I used, I moved on from just a plane object and um, dropped a landscape ob object into the scene. And um, with my poly effects um, nested as a child of the landscape object, uh, let's see that I have, where's my um, effector? This is why it's not, um, my plane effector is not um, working in that. We want to drop my plane effector into the cloners tab. 
That's funny why that wasn't there. Sorry, into the poly effects tab. Oh, it is there. It's funny why um, the planar is not um, effector scale. Huh, that is very, very funny. That should be working in that way, MoGraph wipe. Um, huh. That's funny. You know what, I wonder if it's because I made it on a different version at my, on my laptop. Um, anyways, that's super weird. We can, why don't we just do it from scratch? Because we're here. We'll get a landscape object. We'll use the commander and drop a landscape object into our scene. <coughs> and hit NB so you can see, I always like to get a better visual representation of, um, I like to see the faces or what kind of geometry I'm working with. And we can nest our landscape object under our cloner uh, and in the mode we can turn it into a linear mode and we, will wanting, we are going to be wanting to repeat it on the uh, Z axis, and what do I have here too? You can control it such that you can use math to make your loop. So the object size here is 600, the height as such, what if I made this 400 by 300, okay, and 300 here, depending on how I dropped it into the scene, so that I know um, with my repeater where I want to affect, so it'll loop, right? I can just use the math. Um, and then I said 400 by 300, so if we put this down on the X, um, and I can drop in another landscape object to make it a unique, uh, let's go to the random seed here so that we have a unique, um, let's make it so it's like a more unique um, scenario here, and we'll up our count to four, and then we will use our poly effects, uh, as a child here, let's get our poly effects, MoGraph poly effects, poly effects object. And we will put that as a child here and turn it into partial polys um, and splines. And we will use a plane effector, plane effector, so that we want to set an in and out point here. We can see that that is our landscape object with the plane effector. You can see how it is working in this case, and we will go into our scale and take the position off, and we want on a uniform scale of negative one, and we will set our uh, field of our plane effector to be a linear field, and I will change the orientation of the linear field so that it will be, and let's just take the same poly effects and nest it under uh, everybody here. One, two, three, and I will um, use a linear field and, oh, there you go. I will put it back here. And where do I have my linear field in the poly effects? I'm not sure why it's not working. I've made a mistake somewhere along the way. Um, plane effector, linear field, and, ah, crumbling, crumbling on the vine. Oh God, okay, let me open up a uh, topo map. Let's go to the, oh yes, yes I do. Just not sure why this one's not working. Oh, I used a displacer deformer for the noise. The poly effects is nested as a child of our plane and it is going the back to front. I don't know why the faces aren't, I'm gonna have to, yeah, I'm gonna start. Okay, I'll get, I think, you know what, you guys say, uh, same place tomorrow at 1.30 and I will figure out why uh, my plane effector is not affecting the faces of the polygon. Um, super weird, that's uh, not happened so far for me. But uh, also we will get into looking at the um, uh, uh, Octobot uh, tomorrow and how we came up with a strategy to texture all the dials inside this um, very um, retro, like evil, um, mechanical, gigantic, uh, uh, vengeful looking mech. Um, and that is Black Manta's main transport vessel that he uses to um, chase everybody. Uh, it's called the Octobot. So thank you guys for uh, 
learning a little bit about screen graphics and holograms and uh, what I do and uh, check out more of my work or shoot me a line, say hi, uh, www.robinhatter.com, uh, Twitter. Um, I'm getting into Instagram, so that'll be a new thing and I will see you here tomorrow. Thanks so much. All right. I was going to say give her a round of applause, but you did that. So good job, audience. You guys are doing good today. We are going to take questions in the back because we have our next presenters going to come up. We ran a little bit long, but that's kind of perfect because you got extra good you know, UI, UX stuff. And Robin will be back, so you can have even more questions tomorrow. But she'll be right around the booth in the back here for the next hour. So if you have questions, bring them to her and you can go through all of her amazing scenes. But stay tuned. Up next, we have Gri Young Kim and Woo Sung Kim. So you guys are in for a real big treat. So stay tuned. We'll be up and running as soon as we can. Internet, we'll see you soon.